Hi, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell Rabin. And today we have Fred Allen Wolf on as our guest, who is the author of seven books, the last of which is known as The Dreaming Universe, which is available in all bookstores across the country, Fred was just telling me. It's been published by Simon & Schuster, and uh, it's a book about um, consciousness, quantum physics, and a number of other subjects that we're going to be touching upon today. So welcome, and uh, hope you enjoy yourself. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Mitchell. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Good. Good to have you. Um, this is the seventh book that you have written um, on these subjects. Apparently, you not only know a lot about these subjects, but also have a lot to say about them. Well, it's a... Follow <laughs> quantum physics, theoretical physics. Yes. Unfortunately, this, this brain likes to work out. So uh, I've, enjoyed, yeah. uh, I've enjoyed squeezing it and letting it fill in with more information from time to time. And this was the, this was the seventh squeezing. I see it right. I'm always reminded of John Wayne in the movie with, with yeah. uh, uh, the Geisha and the Barbarians, where he, he meets this, this lovely woman and uh, she, she comes on to him and he says, he, he says he can't marry, he says, because, because after his being with his first wife, she would be like the second squeezing of the grape. <laughs> so I, Where does that I, leave us here? <laughs> this is the seventh squeezing of the, the grape, squeeze. but I think the juice gets better. I hope it gets better as, it, as I get older right. and, as, and, and, and as my writing improves. I, I have a feeling that you're, that you're right. <laughs> uh, what is your background? Could you just go into a little bit about what it is you originally did and how that facilitated your getting into what you're into now? My background is like Chicago Jewish, from Russian Jewish ancestry, mm -hmm. okay? Oh, we're in Russia. Uh, right, my grandparents come from Kiev. Oh. Uh, so so Right. <laughs> so, oh, so, yeah, That's right, why yeah. I was asking. I, just, I, 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 I go back to Russia from time to time to remind yeah. myself I'm glad they left. <laughs> <laughs> and, anyway, and came to Chicago. <laughs> went to Chicago, right. So I grew up in Chicago yeah. um, and pretty normal type of background. Uh, I had a number of traumatic incidences as a child. Uh, I had ringworm with the scalp and I had to have my head shaved. <laughs> so now it's coming back again. You see how they're shaving it? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's taken a while, but it is happening. <laughs> it's happening. And, uh, Meditation, I, that's right, why. <laughs> right, Meditation did it. And uh, I also was a stammering child. I had traumatic problems. <laughs> problems. Uh, so uh, to overcome stammering, r right now I do a lot of public speaking and you probably will never notice that I'm a stammerer. But just like uh, an addict, I'm still a stammerer. But I, hmm. I uh, have learned to, to deal with it in a way that, uh, that I find uh, works for me and uh, probably could teach to others if they were interested. Yeah. Um, well, and that's so fascinating because you speak absolutely eloquently. Yeah. It's, it's hmm. very interesting how I learned to do it. Basically, uh, uh, it's also part of consciousness. I, I bring this up because it's yeah. uh, an interesting topic. Yeah. It's a way of changing my consciousness about who and what I am and what I do with my life and that affects how I speak and how I present myself. I notice that my stammering is pronounced particularly when I'm insecure and uh, mm. as I become more comfortable with myself, the stammering is much less yeah. pronounced. And uh, in order to overcome that, for example, as a high school student, uh, I was an athlete, and so I played football. But I didn't. I was not that big, so I didn't play. You know, like a burly line person hitting, hitting, and knocking other mm -hmm. people over. Mm -hmm. I was a quarterback. And what does a quarterback oh. have to do? Call signals. Speak right? Speak. right. So a lot of times, you know, I was stuck with certain words I couldn't say. You know, like there was. I remember I had to call signals once. Ready set and I couldn't say the word ready and so I would do anything to get around that so I would go heady or <laughs> Wow. Anything like that, you know, and it works sure. because you know the the guys are listening. Just want to, they just want they to hear the sound. Exactly. That's the right. sound. A grunt will work. Yeah, a grunt. That's right. They like grunts, in right. fact. You know. <laughs> like grunts. They prefer grunts. That's it. That's very interesting. So uh, through. So how is it? What is it? What are those situations? Uh, okay. Which well, you find yourself. Well, that's what's. I, I'm a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> I should be asking. No, that no, question. no. It's a good question <laughs> okay. because uh, I found that uh, uh, that my stammering had pretty much dissipated, except under times when. 
I was very stressed, and I noticed that under time when, particularly with my previous marriages, I was very stressed out. You know, marriages make you stressed out, right? Uh, <laughs> except I, I'm married now for the third time, and it's uh, wonderful. It's and wonderful. this is a stress free. This is, this is stress free. This is absolutely the most. Or at least distress. Ap- it's really wonderful. It's just wonderful. Stress, yeah. This is a great state to be God in. I love it. Muzzle tough. Muzzle tough, right? So, but uh, so you know what stress is anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but I found that if I put myself in stressful situations, like for example, I've learned to speak foreign languages. I'm very good. I'm a parrot. I can pick up foreign languages mm-hmm. pretty easily. Mm-hmm. And I've spent time, I've lived in France for a while, I've lived in Russia, i lived in Israel, and I would pick up languages. And I found that as I started to learn to learn, learn these languages and try to use them, because I had such a limited vocabulary, sometimes I would stammer in the foreign language. And the most pronounced, the most pronounced experience of that was in Mother Russia, Matrosia. When I went to back to Russia and began to try to speak to somebody about uh, where is the uh, the marketplace, yeah. uh, uh, or something like this in yeah. Russian. And my yeah. accent is terrible right now, right. but uh, I found I was stammering, and uh, that hmm. you know. So I went back to Mother Russia to find out what about you know Mother oh, yes. Russia. You know, oh yeah, I, all those roots. <laughs> I'm and, listening. Uh, right. Yeah. And so that's basically uh, basically something about the way consciousness works is that when you have very limited opportunities, uh, very limited things, structures to get into, there is a lot of stress. And a lot of stress comes about because of being closed in in our ways of thinking and our attitudes towards our lives and our attitudes towards ourselves, towards the fellow people we're around. As soon as you start labeling and creating and saying that's this and this is that, uh, two things happen. One is you know something about that thing in the sense that that thing will respond to you as it's been labeled, which, by the way, you is the way you give it a form. name. Yes, really? and, that's, and that's very important mm-hmm. because in the Bible, in Hebrew, you find out that the most important Hebrew letter is the Hebrew letter Kof, which is the number 100, which is the Aleph magnified. Now we're doing a little Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. You see, Please. this is going to be, this is going to yeah. be Amishagas, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not me sugar. Right. <laughs> that will okay. avoid. <laughs> but anyway, but please go on. What, when you when you get into this whole thing about what cough stands for, it comes in the word kra, or uh, which is the first uh, time that the cough is used in the Bible, which means to call something something. Wow. So when you label something, you really give it reality, and this is what God did in order to make the universe label things. Very important, very important. Sound. Why did I know very little Hebrew? But when you said cough, there was something about the way you said it that I said call inside myself. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know that that's the case. Yeah, I, it's it's all, it's also a kopf, which is a, uh, if you look at Magritte's paintings, the back of the head, particularly the occipital region of the brain, mm. that area. So there's many, many mystical insights that came to the early Kabbalists in terms of what these symbols meant, uh, which are reflective today of our ways of thinking uh, now. And I think that's uh, now, particularly you, interesting. What is the numerical value of Kabbalah? 100. Uh, the Kabbalah is a study of the letters. Uh, most people think the Kabbalah is a study of certain structures like the tree. But the tree is really a secondary, much more derived uh, aspect of Kabbalah. The, the basis of Kabbalah is the letters themselves and uh, uh, the sacred texts and the first mm-hmm. five books of Moses are very sacred texts and if you read them in Hebrew and everybody says you know unless you read Hebrew how can you do that it's better if you don't know a single thing about Hebrew to read in Hebrew oh, isn't this you interesting listen to the sound the sound is important but what's very important is to learn to see the structures of the letters themselves and to recognize what the letters mean and as you see what letters mean and then you put words together from the letters you find out more about what the sacred meaning of these sounds and letters are than if you would by giving it the so-called popular so labels. So it's sort of the ideogrammatic value. It's what is called the projective language value. This is something that language serves two purposes. It's something called projective and descriptive. English is a descriptive language. It says that's a that, but, it, but a cat is not really a cat. Cat is a sound for that I make to symbolize oh, the I animal. See what you're okay. But if I say bait in Hebrew, bait is a container. It is a limiting process. It, it is helps. the process of creation. Mm-hmm. It's the symbol of creation. Of you know, all all magic is done by limiting your point of view. How does a magician work? Directs you to follow something, limiting your point of view. It's you focus. see the magic, definitely. So all magic is done by limiting your point of view or focusing or li- saying this is this and that's that. 
bait house is a structure which has this is an inside and that's an outside. All these are, are mm -hmm. symbolic. Setting parameters. Right. And when you yeah. say the word bait, you are according to to the sacred use of that, it projects within the body the sense of that process. So it's a mm -hmm. it's the beginning of creation. In and fact, how about this? is the sound itself? I mean, is it on a My way? pronunciation yeah, is something. terrible uh, unless I'm with uh, I would say Arabic speakers because they probably speak better Hebrew than oh, modern the, the Hebrew Sephardic. than modern Israelis. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Sephardic. Uh, Suarez, Carlos Suarez was born in Alexandria, Egypt. He was my teacher mm -hmm. of Kabbalah. And he told me all about how this basically works. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that What's modern. He said? This is well, he said, well, for example, uh, there are two, there, there are several K sounds in Hebrew. Right. And in modern Hebrew, you don't differentiate between the two. But in Arabic Hebrew or in the Sephardic Hebrew, you do. Like uh, kof, and I, I'm not doing it very well. Kof is a, is a Q sound. Kaf. Um, is uh, is another sound? Okay, that's the K sound in uh, in. Uh, K H. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's like um, um, there's uh, Yud, Kuf, Lamed, Mem. These are the, the, the I J K L M. I, I mean, J K L M sounds mm -hmm. uh, of modern Hebrew. Uh, those are those are different than Kuf, which is a Q sound, and Kaf, which means in Hebrew the palm of the hand. Okay, mm -hmm. which is n number twenty, which is a projection of bait, which is number two, is part part of creation. You see, this is mm -hmm. the creator. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it all makes sense when you look at it a certain way. Oh, sure. It's very different from kof, which is number one hundred, which is a projection of aleph, which is one yod ten kof one hundred. Uh -huh. Is 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 aleph in magnification? It means a cosmic principle. Uh, and it means something very different. It's something to do more with the spiritual, with the sacred functioning of language, whereas the two t uh, twenty two hundred have to do with something universal. Like, for example, two bait. We already talked about bait. Twenty is kaf. That's kaf. Mm -hmm. That's hand. Two hundred is resh. And resh, which we use the word rush, like rosh hashanah, mm -hmm. the head of something. Resh actually means universe in Kabbalah. So mm -hmm. resh is a physical. It's something very physical. It's mm -hmm. something that is the whole. It is the whole universe mm -hmm. in creation. The creation of course. Of so is so is. Bet. Yeah, bait too. Bait is a seed like archetype. Anyway, when you learn this Kabbalah from a point of view of never understood, never having read Hebrew before, and learn it as, oh, not this means this, not knowing the, the meanings of the words at all, and then look at certain words, like I, mm -hmm. like what I do with the, with the classes, I'll say, okay, here's a Hebrew word. You have no idea what it means. I don't want you to know what it means. Tell me what it Tell means. Tell me what it means. Right. And these people start telling me what these things mean. And mm -hmm. invariably, there's a student who'll come in with a whole new meaning. And then when I tell the student, well, this is what it means in Hebrew, everybody goes, oh my God, or they get ahas out of it. And this is the whole idea of creative consciousness. Well, really, when I said ideogrammatic, is because you reminded me of um, its pictorial function, just like Chinese and Japanese. That's exactly right. And hieroglyphic. That's exactly yeah. right. right. Did you know that to, uh, I, I don't know why, I, I've been working with, uh, with this class now, so it's on my mind, and maybe yeah. you said you were interested in this, so you don't mind oh, we're talking about this. Mind. For, for, <laughs> I welcome. For New York, this is a <laughs> good, good topic. It's my heritage. It's your heritage, it's a heritage, right. <laughs> we it's had uh, Joseph Moore Cohen on, who's uh -huh. going to be coming later. He wanted to be here for your oh. taping, but he'll be coming at the tail end. Uh -huh. And uh, we've had other people on talking about Kabbalah. You know, there's a sacred way of writing Hebrew. People don't even know this. Mo and I was in the yeshiva, by the way, briefly. And they didn't teach you this to you. They, uh, it was orthodox. They weren't right. into, I w they thought I was too young. Yeah, well, the sacred way <laughs> I is... I was older than they were. <laughs> if you look at the way the letters are written, they're all written by, you start in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, and you you move of course from right to left, mm -hmm. but you start in the upper left hand corner. Mm -hmm. Why there? Well, first mm -hmm. of all, you look at Aleph itself. It's a lightning strike downwards, and then there's two other parts that come in, which break with two broken units, symmetry. Really. Two units. Yeah. One is a hammer on top, and the other is a leg walking. Very interesting. The right. symbolic, if you look at it from that point of view, and Aleph of course is the most sacred of all symbols. The silent letter, the letter that cannot be right. spoken, the mime. The okay? beginning. The beginning. But it's the point is. We begin with Aleph, the rabbi lied. Why? Because the Bible doesn't begin with Aleph, it begins with Beit. It's the first consonant. It's the first creative impulse, is oh. B. Okay? Not, not the Aleph sound. Is it? By the way, ba Hebrew... Is explosive. Too. Yeah, very explosive. You would think that it would be Ma, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't you? As well, ma, it, ma is important. Aleph, yeah. Mem, and Sheen are called the mother letters, the letter Ma, uh, the... Uh, um, 
lettre mère in French, or the mother letters, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to say let, uh, those in autiote is letters in Hebrew. I forgot what mother is in Hebrew. But anyway, um, uh, these are the sacred three letters from which everything else gets created. And when you look at something called anatomical structures of letters, how mm -hmm. Aleph is also a word, so it's spelled Aleph Lamed Fe. Lamed is a word, spelled Lamed Mendal. And you start writing these you things off. You spell letters. You spell letters out, and yeah. you get these huge complicated diagrams which contain mantras in them. All this is stuff that you don't, that they don't teach you in Hebrew school, which if they did, I'm sure kids would get off on it. Of course. You know, why don't or they teach they it? they really taught math yeah. for what it really was yeah. in, in math classes. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things about consciousness right now, which is very interesting, yeah. is whether there's a mathematical structure to consciousness, whether we can explain consciousness from a purely scientific, left-brained activity as being that is there a mathematical computer-like algorithm which will explain how this is doing what it's doing? Well, it's funny. And I'm glad you're asking this question because I because wanted to ask of your entire experience, yeah. Fred, if you could extrapolate from what you know and what you've experienced, both from theoretical physics all the way to taking ayahuasca in Peru, yeah. are there principles underlying all manifestation that you have come there, upon? There are principles. Are there, are, there are definitely definitive. principles. There's something going on here. It's not. It's not a purely random, chaotic dance. That's. That is such a ridiculous hypothesis that it just doesn't even make sense from any, any way of calculating probabilities. Ergo, it follows from just that simple line of reasoning that there must be something of a sacred function going on that cannot be explained through purely anal pu purely algorithmic mathematical logic. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that purely mathematical algorithmic logic is not vital and useful. It's extremely vital and extremely useful. It is the tool of the magician's trade. The mathematics is pure magic in operation. Uh, if people understood what it really was, uh, they would be much more interested in it mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. very creative. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it, in order to, to even think or reason, correctly about mathematics, you have to be super mathematical. You have, your mind has to go beyond it. And, uh, you have to be standing outside of it. You've got to be outside of it. There's yeah. no way you can, uh, there was a, a famous mathematician named Kurt Gödel, G-O-D-E-L with the umlaut over the L, mm -hmm. who proved that any mathematical system cannot, there there's always statements that you're going to be able to make that cannot be proved within the system. Uh, mm -hmm. So that means there must be right. unprovable statements. Well, there's in, always in a meta state, a meta position, and the meta state cannot be mathematized, so to so to mm -hmm. speak. That's mm -hmm. the point. And quantum physics it can't be housed. It can't be housed. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> it's very off like yeah. That's it. Yeah. So when you get to quantum physics, you find that that principle is even magnified even more because there's something side of the mathematical principle about quantum physics itself, which is how that which isn't can affect that which is. And that's, that's almost mystical. But we understand that in a mathematical, it's yeah, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. We understand how that's even possible through something we construct which is called quantum wave function. And that's, that is a non-real, non-physical mathematical form which has therefore both something outside of the, the physical and something within the physical represented at the same time. It's some kind of structure, but it's a structure of thought. And yet, that structure of thought is capable by its sheer magnitude of influencing and affecting and even creating physical materials. So here we have something, we have pure magic, pure Kabbalah, pure, I mean, this is, this is right at uh, the, the heart, heart of things, at right? the heart of things, and very much the heart of, of, of well, the magical Kabbalah. This is always what's spoken of. Um, from, from the own, uh, unknown comes the known, from yes. the unmanifest the manifest, exactly. from the void everything. Well, these guys, the these guys knew a lot. These guys yeah. were pretty smart. <laughs> that's for Very sure. smart. And, 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 what's taken and now we, that's being represented yeah. mathematically. Yeah, it's taken me, uh, I, let's see, I'm going to, uh, I'm uh, at the time that this airs, yeah. I don't know when this is going to air, but I'm, 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 in, into, I'm into, I'm a sectogenarian. I'm reaching my 60th year oh, of life on this planet, which is, for, which is very fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, it uh, uh, it's very interesting because now I'm finally learning wh that, yeah, the, what these guys had to say was right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> but maybe it right. takes time to really to, to follow a path in order to see this. Well, everybody has a different path to there follow. Is different path. I, I, for one, did not, I dismissed math and science. As, as a youngster, as a teenager, and I went right into the Upanishads and the Tao Te Ching. Yeah. It, it opened me up. It related I, to me. Yes. As time went on, my path was that I saw how science and math were proving 
yes. what these gentlemen <laughs> said, yes. these great sages and holy yes. men. And I went, that's beautiful. Right. I thought that was the proper function for yes. science and math, to be in yes. support of a humanitarian and spiritual um, way. It, it's a tool. It's a double-edged sword. It can be, you, we know math and science can be used to build weapons of destruction, for example. We understand that. So uh, it, it's like but everything else. But the word is also a matter but of destruction. It, same thing. Yeah. Right. You have to understand that it begins with the word. And the word is very powerful. How you something affects it. Uh, Lenny Bruce used to do some wonderful things with language. Remember mm -hmm. Lenny Bruce when oh, he was yeah. performing? And I think he was the first one to make us aware of the sensitivities we have to uses of certain language. Like mm -hmm. you call, uh, you call um, a black person a nigger. And that immediately could set up a chain reaction to this person, also almost explosively. Um, uh, and I think Lenny Bruce went to, up to a very strong black person in an audience one time and, and used that term. And uh, this person began to explode. And he said, "What? Calm down, man. He says, look, it's just a word. It's just a word. It has no meaning other than meaning you're giving it to it. You're making it. Ha you're making it happen. Uh, I don't mean That's anything by this powerful. word. Uh, it means the word has no no power over me, but you're giving it power." And uh, and we do that all the time, you know. We sure. label people, we call people this, that. Children especially are very vulnerable to that. Well, um, what you're saying really, Fred, is that we are the attributors of meaning. That's we, the point. We give, we infuse anything and everything yes. with meaning. And we take it away. And that's what happens with descriptive language. Now, when you come back to now Kabbalah and projective language, there's a sacred meaning. And if we forget the sacred okay. meaning, then we're back into the same problem we had before. If we rekindle the sacred meaning, mm -hmm. and we remember the fire of the sacred meaning, then something very special begins to happen. Then creative consciousness begins to become powerful in a person's psyche. And as a result of that, the way they relate to the world is very different than if they remain in the traps of the old ways. Because the old ways are really illusion. This is what my, the basis of Maya is descriptive language. Hmm. Okay? If there's a truth, then the truth can be found through the sacred use of language. Language is very important, but it has both possibilities. Could, could you go over the, the projective definition again? Okay. So <clears throat> make the distinction really clear between All right. In descriptive language, a cat, the word cat is not a cat, because I could say sha in French, okay? Uh, a, a house could be a maison in French or right. casa in Spanish. Neither one of those three words is a house, but a bait is a projective language. In mathematics, for example, is a projective language. The symbols project into the physical world what they mean. E equal mc squared projects into the world of energy is mass times the speed of light squared. We see it manifest. Sheet, when you write sheet music, Beethoven could write down music and would hear the music play in his head. Mm -hmm. This is a projective language. Examples of projective language where as a result, the, the symbols themselves create an experience within the human consciousness. That's projective, okay? Or creates a... So, that there, so there's, there's a visual to it. Yes, that, and... visual component absolutely... It could be visual, it could be sensorial in any way. Uh, it, but the when important you say projective, thing, I mean, the bait looks... If you look at it and you don't know what it is... You say it, it projects in the psyche of the human being, the creative, the creative element, the, bil the ability to become more creative, but see in the or word, more magical. In the word, in the language English, mm -hmm. we, we say build, and I'm yeah. just thinking of build bait. You build a house. Yes. And yeah, there's so some. There, got, the but sound may have something to do with it. Yes, that's very possible. Um, so I, you know, you've got Hebrew. There's mm -hmm. Sanskrit. There's uh, there are other what are considered Sanskrit is similar, like yeah, Persian, like it. Uh, yes. Any of the languages in which the letter in which the letters themselves are words and have meanings, like Aleph used to be an ox, big, big, powerful animal, right? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. You see, that's how it started. I now I see. Bait was a that house. The, that the Gimel was itself has yeah. The meaning. That's of it. A that's word, it. Bait as house. Gimel was a camel. Dalit was a door. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Sure I do. No, uh, yeah. So Vav was a nail. You know, all that. When you Ayn. look at, yeah, Ayn was an eye. Ayn. Okay. Right. So when you look at the meaning I love of those, the way the Arabs do it, way down here. Oh, very important. Yeah. This is very important. All of the Semitic languages, Hebrew and Arabic, are what are called throat languages. They, the, the sound starts here. Uh, English is a, tongue, is a is a tongue language, okay? Yep. But Hebrew and Arabic is a throat language. Do you know anything about the Atlanteans? No. I'll throw this out just for throw it out. 
apparently, and I have good reason to believe this, the ancient uh, priestly language of the Atlanteans was not spoken. And it also originated from here. Oh, really? Yeah. They said speaking was a lazy man's way to communicate. Uh -huh. They communicated vibrationally from here. And many say that, in fact, it's interesting, uh, I think you'll find it interesting that what's considered to be the residual of the Atlantean language known as Vril is Kabbalistic Hebrew. Hmm. That that is Apache, a, actually, yeah. are the latter day expressions of that language. Yes. Hmm. So, anyway. Yeah. That, I'm, I'm just thinking about that when you said that it's actually not up here, it's way down here. Yeah. It's from, coming from a different place. Yes. As it were. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you asked me, uh, what, I think the original question was, what are you doing now? <laughs> what are you doing now, right? <laughs> and what do you know, <laughs> while you're at it? <laughs> so while are... you're doing? <laughs> right. So this is, this yeah. is basically this what is... I'm thinking about right now. And, uh, but you're really talking about the geometry of the letters very much as well, are you not? Yes. When you refer to the experience, when you have the, the students who don't know Hebrew. Yes. But they're looking at the letters. They're looking they're at the responding to shape. Yeah, they're also responding to shape also and reflecting on what each letter could mean in terms of its shape. Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, um, when you draw Aleph, it's a lightning strike downward from the upper left hand corner. And uh, that's symbolic of the spiritual going into the material. Okay? And Heaven the, to earth. Right. And to symbolize that in the most succinct way, we go from Aleph to Yud. And if you notice, Yud is just a little dot at the beginning. But where is it drawn? It's in the upper left-hand corner. That is in Yud, that little, little mark you make, you take your, your pen, and you start down, you push in, and you let out. Mm -hmm. Even the way you do the letters the letter, yep. is important. Everything's important when you get down to the sacred functioning. So when you really get down to drawing those letters, that's why... Everything's symbolic. Very symbolic. So you start at a point, you push, and you relax. That's the Yud, okay? <laughs> you start with a point, you push, and you relax. That's the first strike of the lightning stroke down, same as the Yud. So, when you look at it's all... Yang and yin. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's active and it's, passive. It's, it's the vibration, it's yeah. the story, it, 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 it conveys creative consciousness. That's what it's supposed to do, both the left brain and the right brain. But people don't understand that. They don't realize it. You know, they think, okay, anyway. Well, so this is in the book? No, this is not in this oh, book. Oh, okay, which book? <laughs> <laughs> this is in Mention book. your other books, go ahead. <laughs> this, this. You have the, written about this. Uh, some, some, of the, uh, some of the Kabbalah is in my last book called The Eagle's Eagle's Quest. Okay. Eagle's Quest. Okay. Uh, I did talk about my meeting with my first meeting with Carlos Suarez and how he taught me the meaning of Satan. What Satan is. We'll, we'll talk. Maybe we'll talk about that later. At any rate, okay. um, I'm talking about this now just for this audience because sure. it's a special audience, and I figured there might be a lot of people interested in this yes. about yes. this. Um, when you look at all the other letters in Hebrew, mm -hmm. they're all done by starting with Yud, which means spirit and existence. Every really? single letter starts with Yud. Think about it. Look at all the Hebrew letters and start drawing them. Start, start writing them out and begin with the upper left-hand corner. And notice that bait strikes down, then it comes the bar, gimel, and then this, yeah. dalet, hey. Just think about how you draw all the letters and you'll see they all start in that in the upper left-hand corner. Sheen. You remember Sheen is the one we have three yuds, right? And then like a W. Yeah, you know? of course, sure. Right, okay. Oh. Zayn and Ayn and right. Sade, they're all done exactly the same. So they're built with the meaning of Yud and a the numerical absolutely, value. Absolutely, absolutely. Could you speak a little bit about the numerical value? Because I know that people read, and certainly the Kabbalists will read the, uh, um, the Torah the numeric numerically. The numerical value is a clue to meaning. For example, uh, the letter Sheen is a number 300. So what mm -hmm. could it mean? Sheen is 300, so it's 3, and 3 symbolically is movement. So at the sea level, Gimel, which is a camel walking across the desert, the, the desert at the most right. primitive level, mm -hmm. it means something seed-like. It's a seed-like, it's movement, most basic, the most basic movement, okay? When you get to uh, 30, which is Lamed, uh, Lamed is the walking stick of the scholar, the Lamed, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you know this term. Um, so it, it means organic movement. And if you look at how it's drawn, it's like a snake wiggling yep. in the water. Right. So it's Lamed, it's organic movement. 300 is Sheen, and Sheen is a very special letter uh, because Sheen is hidden in Resh. You hear it, Shh. 
you hear the sheen and sure. resh. So when you write out resh and spell resh, <laughs> you see that resh is spelled uh, resh yod sheen. So sheen is hidden in resh. So it's a special thing. It's a movement. It's a unit. It's the movement of the whole universe, and it's a number three hundred. What could it mean? Well, then you look at certain Hebrew words. Like there's a certain thing called ruach, which means breath. Then it's called Ruach Elohim, which is literally breath translated God. breath of God, right? Ruach Elohim, when you add up the numbers, comes out to be exactly 300. So, Sheen is Ruach Elohim. This is mm how -hmm. the Kabbalists, early Kabbalists, would often find coded the symbolic meaning of certain terms. So when they see certain letters that way, they'd say, ah, this means the breath of God, or this means this, because they know mm -hmm. that the spelling of those words out in regular thing would, 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 would mean. So in other words, when there is, uh, there are parallels in numbers, when you add up words, yes. when you add up the letters, right. and you get a numerical value, right. there will be a relationship between those which come to, to spell 300 exactly. and to spell exactly. 300 here. Exactly. And oh, there's there's much more we can talk about in this. I mean, this Go is ahead. a huge. Well, I don't know how much time. This is a huge topic. We have this we is, have time. This, this is this is a huge this is a huge how topic. This but but I, but I want to talk a little bit about the dreaming universe because Please I think do. it's important. So I'm go ahead. Ask, I, I, I ask a question. Well, maybe this is a question that will lead to that, and tell okay. me if it does or doesn't. Mm. Um, how does your understanding and relationship to Kabbalah relate to the experiences that you've had on ayahuasca, and also, if I could add to that, a subset. Um, your experience with the Australian Aborigines um, and dream time. Well, it, you might say that this was my 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 the self anthropo uh, uh, anthropology. Yeah. Um, it was a uh, it was anthropocentric. Uh, anthropocentric. <laughs> it was my chance really to. I, I went with the intent and purpose of finding out about their cultural ways of thinking. Peru or Peru, Australia? Both Peru and Australia. Okay. I wanted to find out. My, I, I, was, I, I thought of myself as Joe Friday and Dragged Down. I just want to get the answers to these questions, ma'am. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, don't bother me with the details and don't ask me to get involved. Just want you, I'll ask you the question and give the, the observer. answer. I want to be the observer. It turned out I couldn't do it. I had to be a participant, which meant that whatever I was dealing with, I had to deal with it within myself first and primarily and finally only. That's what I came away with. I learned about me rather than yeah about them, although I certainly learned a lot about them, but the it's things I could say about them... Isn't that what the discovery in, of quantum physics was all about? Yes, in a sense that's <laughs> There's true. There's no observer. Yeah. That's anyway, right. In a, sense, I, in a sense that was true. Yeah. Um, when I went to, to Peru, I was investigating, I was working on the Eagle's Quest, my, the book I wrote just before the Dreaming Universe, mm -hmm. and uh, my, 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 my purpose then was to, uh, to understand something about how shamans work. I wanted to know yeah. whether altering consciousness could affect in some way. I found out that it could, um, and uh, in some ways, like I mentioned, through this idea of projection or creating uh, an experience of somebody else through the use of language or through the use of, 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 of chanting. Chanting is a very important part mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. shamanic experience. And through the use of substances which can alter your consciousness, like ayahuasca. Um, we have a, a tremendous fear of drug elements in this society. Mm. And uh, rightfully so. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't understand the sacred use of language, we're certainly not going to understand the sacred use of drugs. Sure. Uh, but they do have a sacred function in most uh, in most societies uh, where they're used. Yes. Um, so, uh, for example, peyote is used uh, by uh, Native American tribal people in, in, in New Mexico and other places. Um, and mushrooms uh, are used in uh, uh, by Yaqui uh, Indians in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. many other substances. Uh, marijuana has been used by a number of different tribal for people millennia. for a long for millennia yeah. uh, and to, to just throw this out is like throwing away part of our culture uh, but to use it without We're have Terence McKenna on the show sometime yes too, by the way. but to use it without understanding its sacred functioning is to handle is to give atomic bombs to children uh, it makes no sense uh, we need a way of dealing with it in a way that yeah. doesn't uh, get into an excuse for uh, for running away from society, which is what, uh, unfortunately, it, it can become. Sure. But when I went into the shamanic world, I went with the purpose of understanding what does this do to me. So I would mm -hmm. take a substance like ayahuasca, which is a consciousness alteration. Mm -hmm. And what it taught me, funnily enough, was it taught me something about the way my brain works when I'm dreaming. This I didn't expect to find.
But I actually learned that dreams are not what I thought they were. I thought that dreams were something that were pictures that lasted over periods of time, just like this is lasting over periods of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it turns out that from what I discovered using ayahuasca uh, and from dealing with shamans, is that dreams are spurts of very vivid uh, it's, it seems like more than three-dimensional activity in which a whole scene becomes present to you as if you were in the scene. It's like you're suddenly transported to another world, but it only lasts for a short time. At least I couldn't hang on to it very long. Mm -hmm. It's possible that these shamans have learned a technique to stay in those worlds longer. You feel that, as in, say, lucid dreaming, that you were Exa conscious yes. during the dream state? Yes, Exa I was very, very conscious mm -hmm. of, but because I'm a, a neophyte of this, I couldn't hang on to it very, very long. I would love to learn. I, I tried to stay in the world longer, but the shamans kept bringing me out. Oh, really? Which was very interesting. Every time I, every time I started going into a world because I wanted to study and just listen to the chanting and go in myself, I noticed that they would bring me out. They wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me stay in it too long. And I couldn't understand why. So uh, it was deliberate on their part. It was deliberate on their part to, to not let me go to, to stay too long uh, in these other worlds. They would, you know, I would snap, they would snap me out of it. And when you were in those, what did it remind you of when you were in those worlds? Worlds I had never seen before. Uh, uh, what were they populated with? Well, uh, uh, one of the worlds was, was a world that, it's kind of, you might say, this is surprising because this, this was about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. and I mentioned it down because in down in Peru. I mentioned it because I just got back from Egypt. Uh, uh, well, I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, in the next uh, whatever. Few weeks. Okay, the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I spent some time in Egypt mm -hmm. where uh, I had some other experiences relating to what I saw in Peru. But what I saw in Peru mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. uh, I found myself in a scene in which I was in a vast landscape. Uh, it seemed to be, um, uh, I, I can't remember exactly whether it was desert or not, but uh, uh, I could see in front of me a huge building that was pyramidal in shape. I mean, it was a huge pyramid, but it was big. I mean, it was like, you know, as tall as a modern skyscraper in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, but pyramidal and extremely white and gleaming. I mean, it was very, very beautiful. Surrounding it was a, a fence. Uh, it was a black, uh, iron great uh, fence uh, high so that you couldn't climb over it mm -hmm. with, a, with a gate in it. Mm -hmm. And I could see through the gate, through the fence, uh, which was surrounding the whole complex of these, seemed like even more than one building, uh, that the building was like a building and people were living in it. It was a modern structure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this was in the dream stage? This was in the dream stage, or in, 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 in this ayahuasca state, when mm -hmm. the shamans were chanting, and I was in Peru and watching this. And then uh, there was this huge pool of water in front of it. I mean, vast. It looked like a sea. I mean, I, I, I couldn't see from one end to the other end. Uh, and it was very, very beautiful. And as I was watching this, suddenly these, these two characters came to view from the right side. And I noticed, first of all, the following. They were brown-skinned. Their features were aquiline. Um, they were very beautiful, very unusual looking. Mm -hmm. They were extremely thin, uh, but they weren't emaciated. They were physically, they seemed strong. They walked with a gait that I have never seen human beings walk this way. Mm -hmm. They walked as if they were royalty, yet they stood no more than five feet tall. They were completely hairless. And except for a white skirt that they wore around their midriffs, they wore no other clothing, no shoes. Um, they were male. Th they were. They appeared male. Uh, I didn't notice breasts, uh, mm -hmm. typical, you know, anything you know, that sort. They appeared male, uh, but I couldn't tell, uh, per particularly what sex they were. Mm -hmm. um, and their hair was like a mohawk. They did. They were hairless except for hair, which was like black, spiky porcupine things which stuck up from about here all the way around to the back. Hmm. And it, it, the like hair, village. Yeah, <laughs> the hair, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not, yeah. I've never seen anything, any creatures like that. Um, and I, I found that extremely interesting. Wow. And I, I watched them walk for, yeah. it, it appeared like a period of time, yeah. and I started to follow them, and they were beckoning for me to go with them into, as they opened up the fence to walk in, I looked, they looked like they were literally either going into the building or going for a swim, hmm. and at that moment, Everything started to waver, and I couldn't. I couldn't hang on to it. 
And uh, I believe the shamans can hang on to it. I think that they, through training using the substance over many, many years, they can hang on to those images. Because when I mentioned these characters to the, to the shamans who were with me during the ceremony, they started to laugh. They said, oh yeah, we know those guys. It's good that you saw them. They were spirits of uh, certain plants within the jungle, oh. particularly the ayahuasca plant. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the plants which are used in ayahuasca. Now, so, what happened a few weeks ago in Egypt that had some parallels? Well, I didn't know. I didn't know I was going to Egypt. First of all, oh. I was invited to go uh, purely uh, out of you know some sort of uh, friendship that I had with some other person, had you been and there uh, I'd never been there before. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was almost a little being Jewish. I was a little afraid of going mm -hmm. to Egypt. You know, mm -hmm. the typical scare tactic that you have about uh, our Semitic brothers. Um, and but I thought, if I'm afraid, there must be something there for me. It's time to go. <laughs> yes. Anyway, I like uh, that attitude. on the plane flying to Cairo from New York City. Mm -hmm. I met my my wife, my my present wife. So that's where I first met her. Oh my! So that's pretty Lord. significant. <laughs> How long ago was this? This was in March of '94. I'll oh, date this now for the yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wow. So that's, uh, oh, that's an even bigger muzzle tough. <laughs> bigger muzzle tough. So it was very recent. That's something. And uh, uh, and, and that you met her exactly. Exact, where? Exactly exactly on the flight. Luxor. No, <laughs> on the flight from from New York to Cairo. And then we began to get to know each other, and uh, we literally had uh, two weeks on a boat on the Nile going into Luxor and Abydos and all the sacred sites uh, where uh, I was doing research on uh, my next book project, which has to do with the human soul. Now, the Egyptians, you know, have wonderful oh, ideas yes, about of the soul. Yes, you mentioned soul evidence before. Right, yeah, yes. Wonderful. But for those that wow, know Hebrew, that's fantastic. Yes, the word for soul, one of the words, for, they have many words for soul, mm -hmm. one of the words for soul is nefesh. Mm -hmm. And if you write that out, uh, nun, fe, shin, and, and then spell out nun, uh, you find that nun, fe, shin, shin is spelled shin, yud, nun, you've got nun at both ends, and if you spell out nun, nun is nun, vav, nun, vav, nun, vav, it goes on forever. So you have two energies going upward into the heavens. You have yud striking downward from the sheen, and you have a structure which tells you pretty much about what the soul is about. Spiraling pillars. <laughs> wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. I think I'll hop the next uh, flight to Cairo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there was many things amazing. I learned about many things I learned That's about about story. about our culture, our, the, yeah. the 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 Jewish culture from the Egyptians. Uh, they don't have the kind of energy against. That's not surprising. Yes. <laughs> Well, yes. I mean, we look came at out where of Moses trained. Yeah, we came out of Egypt, and it may be that we literally came out of Egypt. That we were Egyptian. That we were an Egyptian sect. Now, this is something that mo modern many Jews would be abhorrent to hear, but it explains a lot. It explains the similarity of language. I mean, why should our languages be so close? They are very, 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 very close, and especially well, in the meaning of sacred we're meanings. We're all Semitic people. We're all Semitic people. So Number one, that's important. What does that mean? And there are certain the certain keys. If you look the the passage of the sun in ancient Egyptian religion, it has a certain meaning. Um, it's also indicative of the movement of the soul through life. The opening is called mm -hmm. kefir, which means scarab or beetle. Mm -hmm. um, then you move to sort of not midheaven, but almost midheaven, sort of early morning, um, and that's called Ra, so-called sun god. Then you move into the third stage, which is called Un, which means wise. Then you come to the fourth stage, which is just before setting, and that is called Adon. Think about Adonai, okay? Or Aton, Adon, similar thing. Adam. The fifth stage is called Aman or Amen. And then you go under into, when, mm. according to Egypt text, you don't die, you go west. And necrophilia, or the, the west, young yes, man. That's <laughs> right. the 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 uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, ne the ne you know the idea of necrophilia, or the idea of uh, the west part of the Nile, is where all of the so-called necro temples, the temples of the Netter worlds, mm -hmm, are. Mm -hmm. And on the east side of the Nile are the the other uh, the the birth notions of life. Perfect. So everything yeah. is based upon the movement of the Nile. Yeah. And when yeah. you get to, according to one Egyptian scholar I talked with, who was a mystic, 
He said, you Jews all come from us. We're all the same family. But what happened was that the, the stage of wisdom was un. The stage of aton is even wiser. When you got to that stage, you didn't want to go into the fifth stage, which is aman, which meant death. And you decided to stay with that particular stage, Adon, and make that into your point of worship. So when you escaped, uh, you, were, you weren't being driven out. You chose to leave. That's a very only, interesting the, point like of view. We weren't willing to complete a cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we chose to leave because we didn't very want to go into that stage of worship. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it's an interesting speculative stage thought. Stage of worship? Or, or in well, a sense Aton. Aton is a stage of wisdom. Now think about think think about we Jews. Think about what what we're what we're basically we're basically known as thinkers, and and you know we users of our minds, intellect. We're wherever we appeared in culture, we were used to do the things that the goyim very well because they, they for example money, accounting, thinking. Uh, why were we so good at? Where did this come from? Basically, from the Egyptian point we of view, we weren't known as manual laborers. We were not laborers. manual laborers. We weren't Except farmers, Egypt, actually. But well, yeah, but we were known for thinking and for mm -hmm. for, for, for structures, for mathematics, sure. and uh, this would be music. Music. The stage of wisdom would be the Aton stage, from which you know mm -hmm. Adonai, the loose concept of Lord, would have uh, would have come. Maybe this is true. Maybe it's just Egyptian oh, it's speculation. But it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And who came from whom? Uh, right. Who came I mean, from I home? wonder what Abraham would say about all of this. Yes, that's a, <laughs> yes. And so, the, how do the legends get built up of the Bible and the story of Abraham and uh, and Isaac and Jacob and, and I Sarah? And I have a question, really, Fred, yeah. and I'd be interested to hear what you had to say about it. Is what do you think the precursors of of uh, both the Jewish and Egyptian cultures were, and the Kabbalah? In other words, really, where did the Kabbalah come from? Well, do you have any sense of that? Kabbalah means to receive. Mm -hmm. It basically is a word when you go to and a Kabbalah, by the way, is an Egyptian term. Yeah, and it begins with Kof, the Q, the mm -hmm. 100, so it's a mm -hmm. very sacred mean. Right. Uh, Kof, Beit, Lamed, He. It ends with He, which is symbol 5, which means life. So Kabbalah is the cosmical principle of Aleph, the, the most magnified, okay, <laughs> going into Oh, Cre Aleph and He are. Uh, yes, uh, Aleph. Aleph God, means spirit. If you, uh, I, I, this is very very basic. But I go to New York to teach. Oh, I'd love I, to. I would really I'd love, love to. to have you. I'd love to. What I'd love to work with is rabbis that know the Hebrew language better than I do, because they yeah. could help immensely if their egos aren't bruised by by getting into this sure. uh, stuff. Because uh, for them to hear I me talk about Kabbalah, uh, they may feel I'm being I'm I'm treading on their toes, and I don't mean to do this by oh, any yeah. means. You know, uh, I wouldn't want to cause problems with their their flock. But I think the mystical message is there, and I think I can add something to it uh, from yeah. the scientific point of view. Uh, and from the structural point of view, which I think many of them have missed mm -hmm. uh, due to their unfortunate education uh, right. as not, oh, not, as not being mystical. Parochial. Uh, too, too parochial, right. Which, yeah. is, which is the problem with all organized religion, they have the same problem. Yeah, right, right, right. So what, do you have any sense of uh, the origins of the Kabbalah? If I look at the meaning of the word, that'll tell me, so that's what I was doing right okay, now. Please. So Kof is the, is the cosmic 100 or the principle uh, behind the head the creation, uh, it's the reconciliation of matter and spirit. So, okay, bait is creation, lamed is organic movement, and he is life. So what Kabbalah is telling me is that through its study, uh, the reconciliation of matter and spirit, okay, is created in life, in the, in the movement of life itself. So that means it must be a pretty old principle. So it has to go way, way back. It cannot be something that is strictly Jewish or strictly Arabic, but it must go way back. It must be before that. Uh, according to my teacher Suarez, mm -hmm. he says it goes back to the Chaldeans or Chaldeans mm -hmm. uh, who uh, were or Kasdim. They were into uh, the another worship that the Jews. For example, Abraham, the first Jew, declared was a declared Jew. He wasn't born a Jew. He was born a Chaldean. So it's very possible that mm -hmm. uh, that we have in that culture the roots of Kabbalah, and maybe even before that, because like uh, we speak about Ram, uh, Resh Mem, uh, uh, mm -hmm. that may go back Avram, the father of Ram. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, that may go way back to something before. 
because uh, Ram yeah. is in, we find an Indian text from you know, sure. thousands of years ago. Yeah. So it's very possible that the roots of Kabbalah are, are much deeper, much deeper buried, maybe, you know, maybe as much as uh, prehistory, mm -hmm. pre-written history, certainly. Mm -hmm. And how speculatively... How far do you want to go? But we don't. Remember. When we go back, when we go back, how far I'm, can I'm we go back? I'm just interested yes. to know. There's so many speculations. Well, when we go these beyond days of how long life on Earth has been, how long Earth has been. Yeah. When you go who beyond is Earth, when you go beyond written history, you have to rely on spoken history, and uh, the best at doing that are the Aboriginal people, uh, and they say that there was dreaming going on even before, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know enough of their language to see any relationship with Kabbalah yet, but it's mm -hmm. possible that there is. Mm -hmm. Well, since you mentioned that, and you did speak uh, to my question, the portion concerning ayahuasca, how does So, let's talk about dreams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well... Um, and, and let, you know what, let's just okay. show them uh, this. Yeah. yeah, this book is a tour de force of the whole no notion of dreaming the from dreaming the... Dreaming universe. Uh, it talks about dreaming not it's only from latest the... latest book. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It talks about dreaming from the point of view of why we dream, mm -hmm. and the reason we dream can be said very simply. We dream to develop a self. That the notion of our self as a self is developed in dream. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it begins, for example, in the human, it begins in the fetal stage. Did you know that um, one, of the, one of the signals that we're dreaming is something called REM, rapid eye sure. movement. Mm -hmm. That's the letters REM stand for rapid That's eye movement. That's identify someone in the dream state. Exactly. So uh, when when we look at uh, at uh, dreaming, uh, uh, a rapid eye movement, we find that uh, through uh, people have studied fetuses, you know, and mm -hmm. notice that as soon as the fetal, as soon as the fetus develops eyes, it begins to REM, and people have actually watched and timed these REM periods, and they sometimes are 16 to 17 hours per day. Now, what has a fetus got a REM about? Or basically, <laughs> what has a fetus got a that dream be about? the title of a new book. Right. Anyway, yeah. What is, she, what? What is she, what is mm -hmm. he, what is this, what is this creature yeah. uh, REMing about? And the answer must be, it's got to be integrating data about itself. I mean, it must be developing a sense of self mm -hmm. at this early stage. So what data does it have? Okay, what sensory data does it have? Well, first of all, it certainly has the feeling of movement in the amniotic fluid. The floating of the universe is taking place right here, the beginning of the sense of separation. Because the sense of skin versus water is developing right here. So Membranes. Membranes. So the beginning of the boundary, the bait process yep. is beginning to right, take place container. right here, the container. Mm -hmm. The self of being contained, that's developing right there. The movement, lamed, or gimel, the seed-like mm -hmm. movements are mm -hmm. beginning for very, very Kabbalistically. <laughs> yes. it, it, it all, all of it can be explained this way. I, I like it because it introduces more metaphor. Sure. Okay, sure. so the, now, and, and what's happening in the brain is interesting. This is, I develop a model here called the quantum mechanics of dreams. Uh, which talks about how the dreaming brain uses principles of quantum physics to integrate these sensory experiences to, to sense a sense of self from not self. And it may sound very mechanical, but it's very far from that. Yeah. Very far from that. No, please say. I, mean, I will. She would I will explain it as we go on because it's, uh, okay. it's this is a little more difficult to explain just by talking as if we could do yeah, you know a course. course or something it'd be easier to explain yes, or okay. read in the book it could tell us a little bit more about it uh, but anyway then there are other sensory experiences that the fetus is integrating for well, example real, but, and but you go into this in oh the yes book. it's yeah chapter okay. twenty of the book talks about okay. it in much greater detail wonderful uh, but uh, there are unfortunately other, I see that we've got about five or six minutes left, right so all these sensory experiences movement sounds what sounds what are the first sounds that a fetus hears. I was going to say, isn't the f isn't the ear the first sensory organ that? Okay, and what and what and what does it hear? What are the first things that it hears? The mother's uh, internal movements in the heartbeat. Ba -bump, ba -ba -bump, ba -ba -bump, ba -ba -bump, the rhythm of Aleph, the heartbeat. The rhythm. So the, of the, Aleph. the rhythm of Aleph. Ba -ba -bump, the heartbeat. The very very sense of that, the surging heartbeat. It's a very very important part. That rhythm is intoned, and that rhythm gets integrated as a bass rhythm from which sound, sound experience, and feeling and movement are brought in together. Then as the eyes develop more and the eyes are opened in, inside the uterus, uh, light, which gets filtered through the stomach lining, mm -hmm. can be actually seen. So there's very fuzzy filtering of light mm -hmm. images, colors, 
are brought in. Even with the eyes closed? Yeah, uh, well, you, well, the eyes closed, it may be it's still with the eyes closed. You yeah. can see with the eyes closed. I don't know how much you can see in the, in, in the uterus with the eyes closed, but certainly I think some light gets through the stomach. Mm -hmm. um, but so all these are being integrated. But certainly there are a lot of sounds. I mean, a lot of sounds. Fact, there, there was a recording of some of the sounds on yes. the And believe me, it's not just the heartbeat. No. It is, no. It is gushing and waterfalls. Waterfalls. And, and, and storms and hurricanes. It is quite dramatic. It's quite dramatic. And it's not what you might think is so wonderful sounding all the time. Yes. Uh, but they but do. Anyway. But yes, you're for exactly right. Yeah. And these are very important. And these experiences are integrated into a sense of self. Because what yeah. is outside and what is inside? What is me? What is not me? Where are these sounds coming from? Sure. This has to be differentiated. And that's that process, which is hearing all of a sudden. That which is hearing. So that process is developing, first of all, an outside. Outside of what? Right. The key process here is that not only is an outside brought into, but a sense of mm -hmm. I, a sense of self, a sense of a sense of separation. A surface is being formed in which one says, I'm in here in my own little bait container, and that's out there. And that process is a very interesting one. Um, it's a process of what is called self-reflection, because the self is everywhere to begin with until mm -hmm. this takes place. Mm -hmm. And then the differentiation takes place in which there's a kind of a mirror, mirror effect going on. And uh, how that this works, how that works has to do with something having to do with, with how possibilities of different Different, different possibilities can overlap. And it's this overlapping of possibilities and how they're separated into realities where the process of the self or the I begins to appear. And this, this is something I call mirroring or the developing of the self or the sense in which uh, a recording, a, a memory is being formed, mem, memories are made of this, uh, right. and how the memory and the self are, in, are forming uh, is taking place through this kind of reflection process, and that's part of the book of the Dreaming mm. Universe. So dreams oh, are very important. God. God, really, really, you've put that so well. In fact, what you triggered inside me is looking at the identification of self from this inside-outside point of view and yes. asking the question, of course, it posits what is outside. Yes. And then we spend the rest of our conscious waking lives trying to break out of that sense of self so we can join the big self of the outside exactly. world. Exactly. And most of us have a very limited sense of self to our skin. So when we say, yeah. I'm worried, we're worried about our skin. But if you're Winston Churchill and you say, I'm worried, you're worried about all of England. The sense of self is very different as Winston Churchill in World War II than it is as <laughs> as uh, as uh, as Fred Allen Wolf uh, in uh, in in this situation, and as you become more responsible, your sense of self becomes more becomes bigger. You can't just think about your little self; you become bigger, and that very well is how culture begins to develop and how creative culture begins to develop. Mm -hmm. Those that have the vision of something bigger create something uh -huh. we all can resonate with, right. and therein lies the story of. Everything from political systems to uh, cultural yeah. systems to music to whatever. And planetary systems. And planetary systems. <laughs> Indeed. Exactly. Really. really. Exactly. Well, that is just exquisitely put. I really, really appreciate that rendition. God, I, also, memory and mammary. There's got to be a relationship in there. There is. But Do you know what etymologically what. Mammary? mammary? You mean from the. From, mm -hmm. Yeah, ma from yeah. mammals uh, having mammary glands? Yes. I'm not sure you could. We could guess about that. But yeah. mem. Number forty, the he first uh, the the, uh, the water. Is that is, the, it means water, mm -hmm. uh, and waters of consciousness or resist. Yeah. It also means res four is a symbol of resistance or response to. Oh yeah. Yes, huh. resistance. By the way, is a very important word in Kabbalah. Uh, without resistance, nothing is. Without a container, nothing is. I was just going to say four is a square. So. That's it. That's where and, you truly create the... And the last symbol of the Hebrew letters, the 22nd symbol, is Tav, okay, which, or Thav, you know, depending on how you pronounce it. Th, when it's, uh, you know, when you say Beth, mm -hmm. uh, most people say Beth Shalom, uh, uh -oh. you know, the ha house of peace. We're completely out of time. Okay. Would you come on another time? Certainly, if we have God. time, sure. Thanks so much. <laughs> this is Mitchell Rabin for A Better World. Thanks for joining us. This has been Fred Allen Wolf, and you can pick up his book, The Dreaming Universe, at any bookstore anywhere it's published by Simon & Schuster and uh, it'll be very much worth your while. Thanks for joining us.